My name is Frank Cohen, and I am the Senior Analyst for the Frank Cohen Group, a division of Doctors Management. In 2011, the CMS began processing 100% of all Medicare fee-for-service claims prior to payment through a complex set of predictive algorithms called the Fraud Prevention System. Now, this began a new era in the use of advanced technology by payers with regards to fraud, waste, and abuse detection. Also in 2011, we released our Comprehensive Risk Analyzer, a predictive analytics application that detects procedure codes, modifiers, and providers that present your organization with the greatest risk for an external payer audit. Now, this is the second in our presentation series. The first discusses the backstory of CRA, including the why and how of development. To begin, there are three primary groups of CRA users. The first are what I refer to as the high C's or the C-suite. This is the leadership within the organization. They normally want to get a higher level view of what the risk looks like within the organization as a whole, and normally not much more granular than by specialty. The second group tends to be analysts, whether compliance analysts or coding analysts. It's those folks who want or need to get more granular with the results, oftentimes uh, to validate our findings to the physicians. The third group of users are the worker bees. These are the folks in the trenches, including coders, auditors, managers, and others who are primarily responsible for producing and managing the audit plan. This is also the most accessed report by our existing users. So let's go ahead and begin with taking a look at the high level structure of CRA. Here, you can see six different dashboard views. Five of these identify distribution of risk by physician and non-physician provider for a specific category, and the sixth, the visible risk, is a weighted composite of the primary five categories. Each of these correspond to the categories most often considered by auditors when determining whether or not to audit a practice. Notice that for each category, we identify both the number and percentage of providers that fall into each of those categories. The same is true with the visible risk composite. And from this, a single score of 0 to 100 is created and then assigned to each provider. A score of 0 means that there's no risk. A score of 1 to 65 indicates a low risk. 65 to 85 reports a moderate risk or a medium risk. And those providers with scores of between 85 and 100 are considered high risk as in order to reach this level, their variance analysis reported at least one categorical outlier. Clicking on any one of these will take you to a more granular dashboard of risk by specialty. Let's go ahead and click on the visible risk chart here. Scrolling through this dashboard, you can see that we present the number of providers for each specialty reporting a high or medium risk. You can display more or fewer risk levels by selecting them from the risk level filter. Now the next level of granularity moves us into the more analytical aspects of the program. Let's go ahead and click on say uh, otolaryngology rhinology to get a closer look at the providers within that specialty. Note that we have five medium risk and three high risk providers. This is the risk summary report. While this run is restricted to otolaryngology rhinology due to our route, we can open this up for all specialties simply by selecting all from the drop down list and then clicking on the update button. While there are several menu options that can produce drill down reports, they can all be easily accessed from this one single report. For example, let's say that we wanted to get a better idea of risk for a given provider for say uh, E&M coding. All I would have to do is click on the E&M cell for that provider, say provider 29, and it takes me to an E&M specific report. Now there's a lot going on here and I wanna take a moment to show you some of the great analytics available from this one report. First of all, it shows the overall E&M risk score. You can then scroll through the different E&M categories to identify how much each E&M category is contributing to that score. Notice that each of the individual categories have their own risk score, following the same scalar conventions of low, medium, and high risk. For example, let's look at the new office visits. Uh, let's look first at that provider's individual utilization of new office visit codes. 
Then let's compare that to both the state and national benchmarks for that same specialty. It's clear here that this provider is coding at a higher level than his or her peers across the general benchmark. But what I would want to know is how does she or he compare with just the other otolaryngologists within my organization? And we can see that as well. So not only is this provider coding higher than the benchmarked peer group, but also reports a significantly higher use of the 99204 code when compared to other otolaryngologists within your organization. In this case, maybe you would want to see what all the other otolaryngologists look like in comparison for this given time period. To do this, you would click on Specialty ENM Trend, select All, and then click on the Update button. Now for each category where ENM codes are reported, we can see how the other providers within the specialty scored with regard to each category. To interpret this, the higher the bar, the greater the shift right towards higher level codes, and the lower the bar, the greater the shift left towards lower level codes. In this case, we can see that in addition to this provider, there were three other providers that posed a moderate risk. In addition, there were two providers that were assigned a high risk, provider 27 and provider 34. And as is with everything else in this application, navigation is a breeze. For example, want to see what provider 34 looks like? Just click on the bar. You can also then track this provider's risk across periods just by clicking on the provider ENM trend option. This shows you the last four quarters of utilization and risk for this provider. Larger organizations can organize and report findings by department. Just go to Reports and Department E&M Trend. For example, maybe I just want to know what has happened to uh, the surgical department over the past year. So I would just select Report by Provider Group, then select Surgery, and then click on the Update button. Now there's still a lot more, believe it or not, uh, but enough said about E&M. Let's go ahead and move on. Let's go back to the risk summary report. As I mentioned prior, you can get to any or all of these reports and analyses directly from the menu bar. For example, you can go to any of the dashboards from here or any of the reports from the reports menu option. Once again, we are looking at the risk summary report for all providers reporting a moderate to high visible risk level. Just like with E&M, you can drill down to each of the other categories by clicking on the associated score. For example, to look at RVU risk for provider 29, just click on the score, and it will bring up the detail for that category for that provider. One of the benefits of predictive analytics is the ability to convert complex raw data into scores and contributions, as we have done with CRA. For example, this indicates that procedure code 31231 contributes 21.1% of the risk. Notice that nationally, this is the third most often billed procedure for otolaryngology docs and about 7.1% of total. For this provider, it is the first most often billed procedure at 24.5%. And while there is a lot more that goes into risk assessment than just utilization, this works as a great proxy for understanding the risk scores in general. To see risk for this provider in other categories, rather than having to go back to the risk summary, you can just make the selection here and then click on the update button. Note that this system is built around heuristics, which makes accessing and interpreting the results as simple as possible. The audit action plan is the heart and soul of the CRA application and the most accessed report by our users. This single report is a composite analysis of all of the risk calculations by provider, category, procedure code, and modifier. This report shows for every provider that has some risk up to the top five risk events. For example, for the first provider, we see that modifier 58 is the top risk event, followed by 15003, 15274, 15101, and 11045. In the most efficient and cost-effective way possible, this provides the auditors their marching orders, 
with respect to which charts need to be reviewed for which providers. Now I do want to take a moment to talk about the different flags and icons that can be used for rapid identification of specific and helpful issues. For example, an X indicates that you've already audited some number of charts for this provider for this event and the result was a validation of the risk, meaning that not only did it look like a risk statistically, but it proved to be problematic as a result of the audit. We recommend you re-audit this modifier or code again in three months. A check mark by a code, such as here, indicates that the audit resulted in a negative risk finding, meaning that even though this code may look like a risk to an outsider, you have already determined that it met the criteria and is therefore not a true risk. This icon indicates that the specific code is found within the search study. For example, here it tells you that this code is reported to be overpaid, on average, 26% of the time. When associated to a specific provider, it gives the auditor a hint as to the types of issues to expect for that specialty. For example, for this cardiologist, the search study indicates that insufficient documentation accounts for 69% of errors, while incorrect coding accounts for around 30% of errors. This graph icon indicates that this code is subject to a spike finding. This means that this code, within its own E&M category, was reported more than two-thirds of the time and exceeded a benchmarked variance of 50%. You will also notice that some cells have a dollar sign icon. This means that it is likely that this code was underpaid and may present a financial opportunity for the practice. To answer the common question about how many charts for each event should be reviewed, CRA uses a basic sample size algorithm to calculate the number of charts we recommend you review at each level. The purpose here is to equilibrate between audit necessity and resource limitations. Let's say that you're only budgeted for a maximum of 1,000 chart audits rather than the number that's shown here. You could, for example, eliminate J codes and other HCPCS level codes from the list. Then you could adjust the number of charts you want to audit based on the major category. For example, eliminate moderate level non E&M and modifier charts and those subject to the spike risk. Click on the update button to get a new set of counts. Then you can select to what code level you want to audit. Notice, notice that in this case, if you were to audit to the second code level, you would meet your 1000 chart limit. Some organizations feel that it's important to audit all providers and not just those with a higher or medium risk. We agree, and as such, if you include all risk levels in the filter, the system will identify codes to audit for nearly every provider based on the same risk algorithms. Even for these providers with no risk identified. For the purposes of training and remediation, it is important to be able to produce a provider-specific report. You can do this in one of two ways. You can either click on dashboards and provider dashboard, or more efficiently, you can just click on the name of the provider you wish to examine. This will bring you to a dashboard that is specific to that provider only. Let's take a look at provider 220, a plastic surgeon. This report begins with an overall risk summary and then reports on the top five risk events as found in the audit action plan. For each category, you can drill down to the details just as we did before. We also have a new risk metric here, time, which uses the Harvard Ruck time study to mirror OIG guidelines for determining what's called the medically unbelievable day. This occurs when a provider's assessed time exceeds two and a half times fair market value or 5,000 hours annualized. Here, we see the analysis for three months worth of data. So when the assessed time exceeds 1,250 hours, it puts the provider at a high risk. As with all of our other menus, the detail is only a click away. Here, we see that based on the time data, this provider is assessed at working 19.4 hours per day, 365 days per year, which exceeds the believable day threshold. As with our other tables, this one identifies the contribution to risk as the percent of total hours reported. And as with our other reports, you can create a PDF or an Excel workbook with the click of a mouse. 
going back to the dashboard, we can scroll down to the other risk categories. Uh, notice that for the provider by RVU category, the chart defines both the contribution to risk and the reason for the risk. For example, we expected to see procedure code 15101 reported 0.3% of the time, but instead was billed at a rate of 21%. And once again, detail is only a click away. And while we didn't spend a lot of time on all the detailed reports, know that the modifier risk detail is interpreted the same way as the others. This heuristic programming ensures a very short learning curve for you and your staff, adding to CRA's contribution to overall efficiency and cost effectiveness. I want to finish this up by showing you a couple of other reports that are quite useful. To get a summary of time for all providers, you can click on Reports and Provider Time. Note that in addition to just total time, we report each of the time components. We also report the number of hours per day, the work RVUs, and using our benchmark data, the number of FTEs into which the assessed time translates. If you want, you can limit by specialty, and as always, detail is only a click away. We recommend that our clients provide data on a quarterly basis. Even if you create your audit plan only once a year or twice a year, Quarterly analyses help you to track your progress and validate your resource expenditures. Clicking on Reports and Trend by Risk Category takes us to the Trend Analysis Report, which is a time series of sorts that allows you to see changes in each of the risk categories over time. The report starts with a series of mini dashboards, if you will, that give you an indication of between periods which providers did better, and which providers did worse over that time. Now, for example, uh, here we can see which providers reported a higher visible risk and which reported a lower visible risk between and over a four quarter period. Note that provider 178 had a general increase in risk, while provider 166 reported an overall decrease in risk. You have a lot of options with regard to filters and selections on this page. For example, maybe you want to add EM risk to the page. To select that option and click on the update button and now you can see both categories simultaneously. Finally, we produce an opportunity report. We discovered quite by accident that undercoding opportunity is the same as overcoding risk, only the variables have different signs. One is positive, one is negative. As a result, we are able to calculate financial opportunity as well as risk. This report has two opportunity calculations. The first is peer-based. This is just a comparison of the benchmark between code distributions by category for your provider versus her or his peer group. But this doesn't tell the whole story because unless we know the general acuity of the patient population that provider serves, we couldn't possibly know whether their comparison to their peer group is an accurate representation of where they should be coding. About 15 years ago, I developed the Cohen Acuity Factor, which uses the work RVUs to assist in calculating the time and effort a physician commits to their patient population. By comparing the variances between their non-E&M acuity, which measures the complexity of the procedures being performed on their patients, with the variance of their E&M code acuity, which measures the complexity of the differential diagnostic process, we are able to statistically model underpayments. And in studies we conducted through direct chart audits, we determined that this model is about 85% accurate. We also include CERT data as validation for our findings. For example, CERT reports that code, say, 99213 is underpaid 6.2% of the time and 99212 is underpaid 13% of the time. So it's not just us saying it, but rather a national study conducted by CMS validating our results. This concludes this presentation of the CRA application. Before I go, however, I did want to let you know that, in addition to what you've seen here so far, CRA includes a robust audit documentation, tracking, and analytics package that can be used to manage your entire audit process. In the next presentation, I'll go over the main features and benefits of our audit tracker. Thank you for taking the time to review this, and as always, please do not hesitate to contact me with any questions or if you'd like to schedule a demo using your own data. Thank you.